Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, reform us in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible often reads like a Hallmark movie, and just so you know, yeah, I'm, at Christmas time, I'm addicted to them. The main character believes in true love, but hasn't been able to find it and just gave up. Enter the person they could experience true love with, except there's that other person, you know, the one that they're engaged to, mostly because, well, it was convenient or expected. We all know how the movie's going to end. We even know how it's going to play out. Uh, for the first hour and 20 minutes, they can't stand one another. I mean, they do everything. They even say that out loud. But their friends are always saying, uh-huh, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Then comes a moment of flirting and an almost kiss, which is awkwardly interrupted. 40 minutes before the end, they realize they really are in love. And they are on the verge of, uh, of that kiss and saying yes. 20 minutes before the end, though, there's that misunderstanding, and one or both of them says, that's it, I'm going back to Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, you know, that perfect job, that perfect life, which, well, it's not so perfect, but anyway, I'm going back. And then with only five minutes left, they choose true love over whatever was waiting for them in New York, Chicago, or San Francisco, or Los Angeles. And with two minutes left, they kiss, and we get our happily ever after. Oh, in all the Christmas movies, by the way, it also immediately starts to snow. Now, that's where the Bible and Hallmark movies diverge. People don't always choose the happy ending in the Bible. The church is and always has been an organization of sinners, and some striving to serve God and others not so much. While it should be very simple to know who is who, it's not. Because just like all those people in the Hallmark movies, sometimes our brain gets in the way of our heart, sometimes our heart gets in the way of our brain, and neither of these often check with our soul. In Luke chapter 20, the religious leaders confront Jesus and they ask a very pointed question. Who are you and who sent you? Not bad questions. Jesus doesn't answer the leaders directly. Instead, he tells parables. Now, parables are the equivalent of that moment in the Hallmark movie where she starts to fall off the ladder or slips while ice skating. And the one she doesn't know that she loves yet is there to catch her. Yep. Parables allow for God to be vulnerable, to open up the truth without being so holy or righteous or perfect that we shut down the relationship before it ever has a chance to get started. Pastors are really good at telling congregations, be ye holy, just like your God is holy. They don't mean to be so hard-nosed and crass. Well, maybe some of them do, but let's face it, no matter how they say it, most of us hear it as a truth that we're afraid of, a truth that's going to keep us from our happily ever after. Now, knowing we can't ever be perfect enough for God is why we're in a relationship with someone else. You know, the one where it's convenient or expected, and that relationship might be with the world or ourselves, maybe even Satan. It's not necessarily what we want, but it is what we have. So, Jesus tells a parable. God makes himself vulnerable and open. He draws near enough to us so that we can look into his eyes, and when we stumble, he catches us, and it's a holy moment that forces us to think about who we are and what we really want about our life, love, and eternity. Now, I need to say something about Lutherans. For some, it's going to be like, really? I already knew that. But for others, it's going to be, are you sure? Because my mama told you that you did. Here it is. We do not worship Martin Luther. There, I said it. We don't even venerate Martin Luther. You see, in spite of all of his brilliance and theological insights and all the pain and suffering he went through in order to get us through the Reformation, there's a lot of baggage that comes with him. And I mean a lot. <sighs> but you know, then again, King David, Abraham, Moses, Paul, Peter, they all had a bunch of baggage too. A lot of us would love to change the name of our denomination. Even Luther was not in favor of becoming a Lutheran. Uh, but too many years have passed, and so it's a cross we must bear, and a title that, to be honest, we need to explain. You've heard me say it before. I am a follower of Jesus Christ who chooses to express my faith in Lutheran worship and practice. We are followers of Jesus, but just like Scots wear kilts and Germans wear lederhosen and cowboys wear hats and boots, well, Lutherans wear liturgy, sacraments, catechism, and potlucks to express who we are. It's not our name or what people call us that matters. It's the truth of God. 
but is grace and mercy, it, it, where we find our true identity. See, that's what we need to make sure that people see. They don't see us. They don't see our title. They, they see Jesus. And so it's important we do our best to not distract him with superfluous things that don't really matter. Now, if you've never heard Luther's story, it's actually worth hearing. Son of a coal mine manager, his dad had big plans for him and uh, coughed up enough money to send him off to law school. But Luther was too busy wrestling with God. Was he good enough? Did he love God enough? Did God love him? What could he do to make God happy? I, he was going home in a storm one time. A lightning flash, thunder boomed. Luther made a deal with God. <clears throat> Tell you what, God, if I don't die, I'll become a monk. Well, he didn't die, and he became a monk. And he inflicted himself, and I mean that literally, on his fellow monks, causing trouble by asking questions that everybody knew. You just didn't ask. The Reformation would never have happened except Luther had a mentor and a confessor named Staupitz, who, being faithful to the Catholic Church, was also one who had a proper and very blessed biblical understanding of faith and grace and mercy. Luther would wake him up at all hours of the night to confess his sins, to which Staupitz once said, In all these years I have yet to hear anything remotely interesting in any of your confessions. Luther's soul was in anguish. Luther believed God was angry at him because he just wasn't good enough. And so Luther starved himself. He beat himself, all so that God might see that he was worth loving. But none of it worked. Oh, yeah, God still loved him, but Luther didn't understand that. Staupitz decided to make him a professor, and he actually required Luther to read all of Paul's epistles. You know, all those ones in the New Testament, specifically Romans and Ephesians. Not in the Latin, the Vulgate, but in the original, well, the original language of Greek and Aramaic. Why? Because there were some major differences, and it was there that Luther had his tower breakthrough. Now, the church was a mess, as it often is, building buildings that were monuments to people instead of Jesus, creating titles and management positions, and then having to sell things like forgiveness and grace in order to finance it all. The church leadership looked holy on the outside, but they were rotten on the inside. Just like when Jesus said, you know, you guys are like whitewashed tombs. Yeah, you look all pretty on the outside, but you're dead inside. And yet, God was still God. There were people in the church who loved God. There were people who wanted more than anything to find God. And occasionally, they found each other because of people like Staupitz and Luther and Huss and, well, a whole bunch of others. Now, Martin Luther did not ask, am I a good person? He asked, am I a good enough person? Psalm 84.10 says, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Luther would be content being the doorkeeper, the spittoon washer, the bathroom cleaner in God's house. But he wasn't sure that God would even trust him with any of those jobs. You've probably heard the term C&E Christians. It stands for Christmas and Easter. They're the folks who we see twice a year. Yeah, Christmas and Easter. They used to be rare, but in today's world, well, it's far more common. Pastors have come to realize that they actually are pastoring multiple congregations. There are the people who attend on the first and third Sundays, and then there are those who come on the second and fourth Sundays, and then there are the ones who show up on the whenever my team is in playing Sunday. Now we've added online members, some of whom we know, some of whom will never know who they are or get the chance to meet. So i got to ask you, do you know anybody in Singapore, Thailand, Ukraine, Romania, and Norway? Because those are just some of a few places that have logged in over the past several months and watched parts of our worship services. The church of which we are a part, and by the way, we're talking about the Christian church, founded in the Garden of Eden when God came down and walked with his people, even though we may be splintered and fractured because we are sinners. We exist, commissioned by God, to connect people to Jesus. Squirrel moment. Did you know that if you bought or had an original piece of Lego created in 1932, that you could connect it to a piece of Lego that was bought well, right now, just down the street, or on Amazon, or at Alamoana, the Lego store? That's pretty amazing. Here's how it connects. God knows people get lost. He knows that they have their doubts. They wander away looking for something. Yeah, Chicago, Los Angeles, you know, all those places where their perfect life, they're pretty sure, is waiting for them. But he also wants them to know that they can always come home, no matter how long they've been gone. 
And God wants us to be here to greet them, to love them, to welcome them. The church has a tough job reaching people who wandered off, who were never connected in the first place to any church, or who have different ideas about God. Not to mention that we're all very, very different when it comes to our jobs, incomes, disabilities, ethnicity, education level, expectations, culture, traditions, and age. But you know, God says that it's enough to have Jesus in common. Did you know Luther wasn't just a church reformer? He was also an education and a sociological reformer. This is one of the things he wrote. To help a man so he does not need to become a beggar is just as much of a good work and a virtue as to give alms to a man who has already become a beggar. In other words, Luther was encouraging the government to fix things before they became a problem. When it came to educational reform, he said, Dear rulers, I maintain civil authorities are under obligation to compel people to send their children to school. If the government can compel such citizens as are fit for military service to bear spear and rifle, to mount ramparts and perform other martial duties in times of war, how much more has it a right to compel the people to send their children to school? You know, Luther knew the church. As the book of James he greatly struggled with noted, had to minister to the whole person, body, mind, and spirit, in order to share the love of Jesus. Barriers to the gospel can be politics, socioeconomic stresses, age, gender, ethnicity, the past, present, or future, family, and other things, and sometimes being able not to pronounce words. No church can reach everyone, but every church can reach someone. And there are lots of someones out there who want to be reached, and thankfully there are also lots of churches. When we were baptized into Christ, we were baptized into his death. We had to die to the power of sin, death, and hell in our lives. All the unholy places in us, all our unholy thoughts, our unholy desires, they all died in that tiny splash of water. Oh, and before you sit and try to figure out how such a tiny amount of water can wash away all of the sins of the world, don't bother, because that's what Luther was trying to do. And he couldn't do it, and let's face it, he was brilliant. So uh, no matter how hard he tried, we probably don't need to waste our time. Luther was crushed under the weight of what the church had done. And by the way, what it still does. You see, we're always messing up God's promises and love. Now, before we go into the whole, I can't believe the church was charging for forgiveness to fund a building campaign and sell leadership positions to the highest bidder. Mm. Well, at least 93 other things that Luther eventually addressed as his 95 theses. In other words, discussion items. We need to understand that there are things in the church today just as evil, just as unbiblical, just as crushing. We are a forgetful people in more ways than one which is why we need a Reformation Sunday. When Luther read things in the Bible, like all have sinned and fall short to the glory of God, it made perfect sense because that's how he felt. He had failed God. He had failed his family. He had failed all of his monks and all of his lawyer friends, and he had failed himself. What Staupitz made him do was read the rest of the verse. You see, there's two parts to that verse. The first part, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then it says, but are justified freely by God's grace through the redemption that we have in Christ Jesus. The word all actually means everyone. In other words, nobody is exempted, neither from the sin, but neither also from the grace. We're all in the same movie. We're all trying to find love and forgiveness and purpose and forever. And I know we just came home to church for that wedding or that baptism or because we want our kids to have some morals or it's Christmas or Easter. Because remember... That's one of the big themes that's always in those Hallmark movies. The, they, they left New York or Los Angeles due to, well, a midlife crisis, or they had to come home for a funeral or a wedding or something else. See, it, it doesn't matter why we've come home to the church. You see, this is our home. I, I know it isn't always the most comfortable place. Sometimes it's you, sometimes it's me, sometimes it's just life. But this is your home. I know there's a perfect life waiting somewhere else, and there's always someone who is convenient and expected, but this is still your home. And I want you to always, and I mean always, remember that. Oh, and before you think, I'm talking about this place called Ashiaia and the pews and the sanctuary and the lay on the cross. I'm talking about a church. I'm talking about your church, the one where you're most at home at. Not because they always agree with you, but because they love you. 
and they take you for who you are. In 1517, Luther came home to a place he had always been, but never known. It's no different for us, and the Reformation didn't end, even though the history books have a date and a big period behind it. Every time we, either as individuals or as a church or a community, fix something, it's in our nature to break something else or break what we just fixed. God is always at work redeeming and making the unholy holy again, whether it's a church, a community, a world, or us. Reformations will be necessary until Jesus returns. We must always be in the process of a reformation. Reformation Sunday is where we celebrate that everyone, the all from Romans chapter 3 who are sinners, but who, thanks to Jesus, are also the all who are loved and forgiven children of God. You know, and because they're children of God, and this is God's house, I think you can see where the happily ever after is going to come in. And we don't have to wait until the last two minutes of the movie. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.